Welcome everybody. My name is Tom Wilde from Pro Writing Aid, and I'd like you. I'd like to welcome you to another Ask a Book Doctor session. Uh, my guest, as always, I, I've run out of ways to introduce her. Just, but the the one and only, the unique Sally OJ. How are you doing tonight, Sally? I'm doing really well, Tom. Thank you. you. I don't know if you can hear. I've got two, you know, big skylights in this room, and the rain is pattering on them, which is a lovely sound. Uh, it, it's, in case you think I've got a typing pool in here, it's it's actually the rain. The rain on the window is a very nice sound. And I'm just, doing well. It's just started, hasn't it? Although we, mm. we have had a, a day of rain on and off here in Brighton, yeah. Um, Sal, tonight we are looking back at one of our old favourites, Show mm -hmm. Don't Tell. Uh, and it's a term that's frequently banded about um, in writing communities, in the world of writing, and talked about as something that people consistently get wrong uh, or, or don't understand. Um, so let's just go back to, you know, a bit of what we covered last year and just look at, firstly, where do people go wrong with Show Don't Tell and how do we, how do we classify it? How do we recognise it? People go wrong primarily because um, it's, not, it's, it's not explained very well. Um, and that's almost uniformly across, across the, if you look it up online, if you look it up in books, I understand show, don't tell really well. And if I look it up, it's bewildering. Um, so I always use this one quote and I always, and I've used it before in this, the, the session we did last year. I always say, this is all you need to know about um, Show Don't Tell, and it's from Anton Chekhov, from whom we get some really good writing tips, and he used to write to his friends about writing, and that you get some really good stuff from these letters. And he said about this very problem, don't tell me that the moon is shining, show me the glint of light on broken glass. So we can go now, that's it, <laughs> that's, that's we're done. Um, <laughs> You've used some great examples before as well, Sal. I, I know, and you've shared some examples of, you know, how this has come across in some of the work, the, the books that you've mm. worked on. But it's so it's an incredibly common problem, particularly among new writers. New writers, or, yeah, yeah, and partly because I think they've they've heard about it, and they desperately want to not do it. And of course, the more you do that, um, really. All, all you need to remember with Show Don't Tell is that the idea is to make the reader feel like they are there in the scene with the characters, not being told about it by you. Love that. So that and that's it. It's that simple. And, and so it's all very well to say, you know, we went to the beach, it was a bit cold, so we came home again. Okay. But, you know, our feet crunched over the shingle as we huddled into our coats, the wind whipping our face. I mean, that's a bit purple prose, but you know what I mean. Yeah. Then we're there on the beach with you. So. So I, 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 in my head, Sal, I always picture almost picking up your reader. Imagine a small, small <laughs> person picking them up and dropping them in the scene where, you know, that you're setting. How and do you. Believe me, Tom, if I could, I would. Um, <laughs> It's like one of those 1960s science fiction films. Yes. Um, I, you, so this is really all you need to do. You just need to bring your reader into the, into the scene. And people are scared of purple prose. I tipped over a bit into purple prose with the wind whipping your face. But you can do it. I mean, if you're a good writer, you can carry it, carry it off a bit of detail because bringing sensory detail into a scene is really helpful. The sight, the, the smells, the sounds, the, the you know, gravel crunch and shingle crunching under your feet is a great one because you've got several sensory things going on there. But you don't have to do it for the whole scene. If you did it for the whole scene, it would become a bit too much. But if you just flash, if you just drop in moments of sensory stuff, you drop in moments of dialogue, this is really helpful. So you can have quite a long scene, which is all tell. But if it's broken up with moments of dialogue, okay. and, and, you know, ideally dialogue with some nice um, dialogue tags or signifiers, as I call them, which is, you know, which gives a bit of detail about 
the, the room or this again sensory stuff or whatever you know this is that's a great way of pulling pulling your readers in so it's it's just I'm going to repeat myself it's just about making the reader feel that they are there in the story with the protagonists yeah. and making it feel as if they're experiencing it through the through the the character's own um feelings responses and actions and not through your summary of that I, i'd love to hear so some of examples of course you have to do it sometimes of course you have to do it sometimes but the more you can just pull us in sometimes that will and again you know the thing that i always say is look at some of your favorite books mm. you know yeah. you'll see that there's pages and pages of telling pages of telling but what they do is that they drop in these moments of showing and that keeps us engaged and that makes us feel like we we're there it makes us feel like we're in the moment so it's it's getting the balance right that's really um, important mm. I, I just just before we go on I'd, I'd just like to hear from any of our uh, listeners our joiners today um you know what was it for you that kind of when the penny dropped, if you like, or is, it, is this something that you don't struggle with and actually you think is remarkably easy to get right? Um, uh, or on the flip side, who, who does continue to struggle with kind of um, you know, bringing the reader into the scene, uh, as Sal's described? So if you have got anything to add to that, do, do drop that into, um, into chat, please. I, um, when we were talking the other day, Tom, um, I remember I used... Well, I remember partly because you reminded me of it. So thank you very much. We use this example. I said it's 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 all it's very all very well to say he was upset. So you give us you give us that fact, so we now know that your protagonist is upset. But if you say, I think what I said is he he felt blindly behind him from a chair and sort of his something about his legs went weak and he felt blindly behind him for a chair, his heart racing or something. You know, then you don't have to say he was upset. Yeah. You show it. You show it to us. You don't tell us. That is the thing. You show us. Yeah. You don't tell us. That's the difference. So again, some, you can sometimes, all, you can all go home now. I guess some, yeah, yeah. the difficulties, I guess, as you're as you're it, it can be very easy to get caught up in the writing. And and, and uh, you've got to pay attention. You've got to be you've, you've you've got to be focused on your work to realize actually I'm I'm telling too much and not showing enough. And and there's some interesting comments coming in. So um, yes, oh thank you, Razi. So the notion of sensory input really helped me. That's a really interesting point. I think yeah. it, it did me as well, um, Razi. So Amanda, I struggle with showing my characters' thoughts in the scene. And Leslie said I struggle with not using the same words or phrases several times. That's yeah. an interesting point. Repetition can be a real problem. Um, you know what helps with repetition? You know, one day I'm going to be rumbled and somebody's going to watch all of these <laughs> all, all at once. And they're going to say, she just says the same thing over and over again. Repetition is really easy to spot when you read out loud reading out loud solves so many problems and even better if you can get somebody to read your work out loud to you which is a huge ask yeah it's a big ask but it's because you see where they stumble you'll hear it you'll hear this, the same thing coming coming back twice um but i recognize that's not quite what uh, the question uh, the, the comment was the comment was that they know they're repeating themselves they just find it difficult not to but um this is and again repeating what i say part of being a writer after you get to a certain point once you get to the point that I'm, i imagine all our authors today are at you've got to start pushing yourself it's mm. hard work you've got to start challenging yourself and pushing yourself and this is one of the things that comes up over and over again and this is one of the things that show don't tell is a part of is people not pushing themselves and I sound, I sound like a parent don't I you've got to push yourself but it is really true that you once you're sort of very comfortable you must start stretching you must start pushing and stretching and being more imaginative and being more creative and thinking so you're uh, the the person who asked the question there I'm sorry I didn't catch the name or not, didn't ask the question stated yeah. the issue um is aware of the problem that's fantastic that's a huge part of the battle one now 
they have to really sit down and think, right, how am I going to solve this? I'm a writer. How am I going to solve this? Maybe I'm going to look at some books that I like to see what they do. Maybe I'm going to um, rewrite the same paragraph 20 times until I come up with something. You know, this is what you have to do. And gradually, it's like driving a car. It will become second nature. I always yeah. find putting it to one side till the next day and, and taking yeah, a fresh pair of eyes to it. Exactly, but exactly. There's some great, um, actually, and in chat, thank you everybody so much because there's there's some great tips in there. Um, Jay Moogs, uh, I have to drop in the show when I edit for the first time, then expand in further edits. That's a great, simple technique. Okay, if you recognize it in the first. If it's something that maybe you're not, you, you're aware that is not a strong point of yours and the first time you edit, that's when you can catch it through reading out loud or, or whatever your technique is mm. and then expand on it in further edits. Um, I think that now an interesting point. So someone else uh, just mentioned that it, they discover it, that showing resulted in more words. Is that an issue? It, it, yes. Well, yes. And that's why a lot of people avoid it, I think, mm. especially if they're trying to keep their work. But this is, again, it comes back to what I was just talking about. Yes, it, it is more words. So you've got to push you know part of being a writer is is working out the solution to that i i, I mean i know i can't you know it, it, it's my job to explain these things i can't just keep saying well you've got to work it out but part of it is just having to work it out yeah if i'm working with somebody of course you know one-to-one -one, i will try and uh, try and address all of these problems but yes it will put your word count out if you don't cut somewhere else so you're going to have to cut somewhere else and an awful lot of telling is waffle an but awful think... lot of telling is just padding and waffle and it can be very nice padding but it's still padding so an awful yeah. lot of telling can go uh, and and actually yeah like you say this is this is still that's not a reason not to do it um <laughs> Something that Tom mentioned, thank you, Tom, showing reaction when I got into the character's fear. So, yeah, so I'm actually getting into the feeling of your character. And then the reader said that they were they were with, with him. That yeah. made the penny drop. That's great. Really. That's brilliant. That's exactly what you want to do. That's really brilliant. Yeah, great. I'm sorry. I'm just working through. The, yeah, using dialogue tags to bring in sensory bits. That's great. Mm -hmm. So. Please do all these comments. I, I, I can't keep up with them with chat, chat actually, but that's great. And I hope they're helpful to others out there. And another good um, uh, evidence, I suppose, that, you know, being part of a writer's group where you can share these ideas, uh, where you can talk about the things you're struggling with is uh, time very, very well spent. Okay. So we talked about, you know, sensory language. We talked about dialogue um anything else i think one thing you mentioned the other day you, in, enhanced description you mentioned as yeah well. I, I mean w when you uh, enhanced description doesn't have to be you know it's what we talked about not wanting to, to fall over into purple prose mm -hmm. but it, it's the same kind of thing if you, you know the dust on a banister you know the the smell of cooking in a hall not cabbage please in the hallway um it's like if I start to twitch if people smell cabbage. <laughs> I start to twitch if people get shoulder wounds. Um, Brilliant. But, but um, uh, you know, small, small, you know, and then, of course, there's the thing, you know, if you read about show, don't tell, you often read about something called the telling detail, which is if you can crack that, that's, that's very good because it's a thing that brings us immediately into the moment. And I remember the last time we spoke about the telling detail I just made up on the spot, this thing about going to visit an, your aunt's house and it smelled of wet dogs or something when you were in. And I said that, you know, tells us so much about her just as soon as, as you, you go. You know, if, if you drop into a scene, uh, I mean, this is a very crass example, actually, but if you drop into a scene sort of from nowhere and somebody's walking along a hot, dusty street and a cow ambles across the road you know well, you, you're probably somewhere in India then you know so it's yeah hopefully the, the telling detail will be much more subtle than that but these are things the description telling detail these are things that can help really tremendously yeah and if, if you come from a background of kind of being uh, writing at work so business writing or, or journalist you're probably oh, going to struggle the most 
absolute killer. This is another thing we were talking about the other day, isn't it? This is, I mean, I find this over and over and over again. People who have got careers as journalists, you know, very successful journalists or who write, um, you know, they're very successful business careers and they write reports and so on all the time. The change from writing in that way to writing, especially fiction, is everything you've learned you have to just throw out or not even throw out just to, to turn it on its head yeah so everything you've learned that you absolutely must not do you really have to do with fiction and and funnily enough one of the ways that this affects showing don't telling is that you know journalists and and in business writing you're you're taught to use punctuation really sparingly mm. really really sparingly in fiction punctuation can really help you a, you know a dash a, a, a colon a, an exclamation yeah. mark which you know is for journalists is absolute no-no all these things not perhaps so much in the narrative but certainly in the dialogue can can yeah. really help to 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 warm things up and that is what you need to do when you're showing not telling you are bringing warmth into your book you're bringing warmth into your story and you are you are it's like um dro dropping a little magic drop onto your page and suddenly it infuses yeah. with color you know yeah. that's that's what you're you're doing love it that's a, 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 a great example um okay i just think there are a few questions going to chat just don't forget if you if you do want me to ask a question to sound put it in the question and answer box as well um, I picked up on I know Michael you asked how much show to use compared to tell and I know some of these questions might be asked internally amongst the group if you see what I mean so that's absolutely fine but um, I can't always see them in chat so Sal should we constantly try to show? No you did skip the balance right if you constantly try to show it's you're going to exhaust your reader yeah uh, I okay. mean some it depends on the genre it depends I mean you know if you've got a huge swirling historical ep epic you, you are going to show much more it depends on the story it depends on what's happening i mean it's like i said if you look at your favorite books you'll see there are long tracts of, of just telling but you don't notice because the showing is very good and it, the showing is dropped in but no not only showing it that's too much you'll you'll give your you'll give your reader yeah. ice strain if if it's all just so a few questions are ready to go through, Sal. So let's let's start looking at a few of those. Um, so we have one. So this is quite a long question. I'm just going to read it out. Is there a good tip to avoid showing while trying to describe moments when multiple characters are moving around the space? I find myself writing like it's boring, weird choreography that feels out of place with the tone and voice of the halfway good stuff surrounding it. So that's not showing, that's over-describing. Right. Um, uh, so, uh, and it's a very, very, uh, if I sounded a bit strict there, it's such an easy trap to fall into. It, this is what I said before. It, this is, if this isn't the, something that comes naturally, and to, to a lot of writers it does come naturally, but to uh, most writers it really doesn't. And writing is a skill. Writing is a skill that you get better at and you learn from. You know, a lot of authors, they can't look at their first book. It makes them cringe. You know, it horrifies them or even their second or their third. So it is, it becomes, you know, there's a thing called the Rumsfeld box, which I'm sure people are, you know, which is, we've talked about before, which is uh, unconsciously incompetent, consciously yeah. incompetent, etc., etc. With this skill learning how to write by showing rather than telling it's it's often something you have to practice and it the, the really great thing with the person who asked this question is they've identified the problem that is m so much more than half the battle won if you know you're doing it what well, you've just got to take time on i mean i you know because there will be a hallelujah moment so take time take that page take that set paragraph or three paragraphs or whatever it is break it down work on it what can you lose what am I trying to say that is a very good question with this issue what am I trying to say yeah what do I want to get what's the thing I want to get across here what do I want how do I want the reader to feel that they're in 
in this scene with me? Do they need to know every step that the dancer is taking or do they need to know that they swept past gracefully the silk whispering as they passed? You know, so think about how you can use brief but telling descriptions. Okay. Um, I, I don't know if that's helpful, but but knowing knowing that you're doing it is such a huge part of 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 getting it um, sorted out. So when you go, just going back to what you're saying about um, dialogue, can we just divert for a second into dialogue tags? Um, yes. Which you did mention. You, uh, you, 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 okay, what do you? I can't remember. You call I call them, them signifiers. Signifiers. That's right. Mm. Um, and the, ar rebel. the argument around whether you said rather than. Um, well, I really am a rebel here because I differ. I differ from almost everyone, but obviously I'm right and everyone else is wrong. That's the thing we have to hold on to here. <laughs> I, over and over and over again, you'll see the advice saying, just stick to said, just stick to said, don't get fancy, don't get clever, just stick to said. I really strongly disagree with this and again if you look at you know Sarah is a great example now Sarah does use said of course everyone does and you must use it I'm not saying you must never use it you must use it most but he mumbled she whispered they sneered doesn't that tell you so much more yeah doesn't that give you so much more so used wisely and again getting the balance right balance, you don't want yeah. every every said is invisible uh, and you know people say good writing is invisible which is true you don't notice said unless what unless what's very hard and I don't mean difficult I mean hard on the brain is he said she said they said he said 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 if you've got it in a sort of a, a big block of dialogue and it's just said 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 that's then that does you do stumble on that and a good writer will break that up with a few mutters or whispers yeah. or something. Um, so you just use it. We're back again to the condiment, aren't we? Yeah, How have absolutely. we done so long without <laughs> mentioning condiments? Um, so for those who are not familiar with my well-worn example, you know, it's like having a bit of sauce on, on the side of your plate. You know, you don't want it all over your, well, some people do. You don't want to smother your food completely with ketchup, but a little bit will bring out the flavour. That's what that's what you're after. I love it. Um, thanks for that, Sal. There's some good conversation going on in chat around this point as well. Um, and I know so there's come comments around scoring on pro writing aid. Um, don't forget that pro writing aid is is you know it's using a, an al algorithm. It's machine learning, so it it's not. It always is black and white so you, there is a, an element of you know it's it's up to you as well to um to get to find that balance um i'm sure you'll agree um okay back into the questions um chris interesting one from chris is there a danger that showing tends to rely more on passive voice shouldn't do no Should, that shouldn't do i mean you and again, it would be as this is advice that I do agree with. Try not to use passive voice. It, it makes the writing mushy and it makes it, it diminishes your authority as a writer if you use a passive voice. And it, it can be a hard habit to break, but it's a, it's a habit worth breaking because it gives the writer, it gives the narrative so much more authority if you're using the active voice. Yeah. If, if you can get, you know, if you can, I mean, I'm sure people are going to cite some very successful. I would be surprised, actually, but I'm sure there are people who who prefer the passive voice. But it's not. I I, I don't think it's pleasant to read. Actually, uh, generally, it's 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 a bit unnerving if it's used consistently. Of course, you can use it in dialogue but naturally, and of course, I'm sure there are places where it comes up. Yeah, but it shouldn't. Uh, I, 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 it makes me wonder, actually, it might be interesting to do a bit of a session on passive voice because mm. I think it's also commonly mistaken and people commonly um, get, you know, get it, think it's the passive voice when actually you're not using the passive voice. Mm. Okay, um, so 
Farsis are showing using dialogue, but how much versus other environmental descriptions? Okay, so that's back to the point of balance, really. Um, it is, and I mean, I, of course, it's. I, can you hear the rain? It's yeah, really I, well, loud. I can hear. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's got. It must. Nothing must be shoehorned in. Okay, it's got to be natural. So. If you, I tell you what, very good examples you'll find for this is crime, crime books, because they'll, um, you know, there'll be a lot of telling. They walked across the field, they could see the evidence tent in the distance, you know, it, they felt their stomachs clenched, that's all telling. But then you've, you've got one of them saying to the other, this isn't going to be a good day, Sarge, you know, and you'll, there with them just for a minute and then they walk on so it's just pulling us in very gently from it doesn't have to be huge tracts of dialogue yeah. it, it's it, it, in fact to, to, for this purpose just quick exchanges work really really well mm. yeah okay uh and ian asks um says i struggled to find the right balance between tell and show if you keep using the five senses, it can drag the pace back. Yes, it can. Um, so again, it's, I'm trying to think of a different way, to, and this is no disrespect to the person who's answered the question, I don't mean it that way. I'm trying to think of a different way of, of, of approaching that question. Um, you don't have to use all five senses. Uh, you know, a smell, a, um, the taste of, of, I mean, look at Proust, you know, the whole thing's kicked off by the, the taste of a, of a cake, it starts the whole, the whole thing off. Um, you can, uh, you know, see, seeing somebody in a red coat, you, you know, you, you do not have to use all the senses. It can just be a little, check a little a little touching base in a sensory way so you don't have to overload your writing with sensory information in fact that you know that is, will be too much as you have correctly identified yeah so pick the thing again come back what are you trying to say what do you want your reader to know yeah. with this passage with this bit with this page with this moment what is it that you're telling your reader yeah. so will they get more from the taste of day old bacon, or will they get more from the sound of a cuckoo outside? That will, that's really evocative. That's going to place you somewhere. Or will they get more from seeing that man in the in the blue scarf again? You know what 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 is going to give them the most at that moment in that particular seen in your book what it's going to help the most that's what you need to focus on i i love that um suggestion sal i also love your examples i always love your examples i don't know where you get them from day old bacon so that's almost as good as the, <laughs> the, 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 the hunt for weasel eggs that we had a few months ago <laughs> which is but it would be a brain. very vivid taste day old bacon <laughs> I'm, I'm guessing they would they, tell you it would tell you that they left a day ago would it not so combined with the smell of weasel eggs <laughs> um okay uh but yes back back to the point uh so ka turnbull how do you use showing to replace some dialogue tags when your scenes have more than two more than two characters speaking among each other when when you've got a, a lot of people speaking dialogue tags are are very important and you yeah. you use the show and tell not the show and tell you use the showing it in the dialogue tag so it, it's really simple so yeah so um uh, i don't know what you mean he was standing by the window languorously his blonde hair flopping over his forehead there you go you've showed and it's broken up the dialogue and you know who we're talking about because he's the only blonde man in the room bingo done so it's, but please write it better than what I just said. So um, these are really great, di what I call signifiers, dialogue tags, are very, very good places to, to, to show. 
and yeah. to give information and to give uh, information about the people. You can remind people what your characters look like. You can remind people how old your characters are. You can remind people of their uh, uh, sort of demeanor. You know, you can do it, but you can also give people more information about the place that they're in. You can also give more information about the weather. You can give more information about, you know, I mean, it's never ending. Yeah. So the patter of rain on a, not so much a patter as a machine gun rattle now of rain <laughs> on, on the skylight. You know, these are, these are things that will all bring us into the story and tell us more because this is what you've got to do. You've always got to think of your reader. Yeah. What do you want your reader to know? What will help your reader? What will bring your reader into that moment? This is what you've got to focus on all the time. And it can be the thing that goes to the wayside. When you're certainly in the first draft of your book, it can be very easy to forget about your reader. So this is one of the things you've really got to focus on. And, and if you're focusing on your, the needs of your reader, a lot of these things should start to come a bit more um, yeah. naturally. Can I just, I feel like I'm not talking very clearly and I'm so sorry, I've got, I've got this thing with my jaw called TMJ. Oh. And it's really, really bad today. And I can't, some people would oh, like, I can't, I can't open my mouth very wide. So I know I'm, I'm sort oh, of wobbling a bit and I'm, I am sorry. No, so you're coming through loud and clear. So if, I do, if I do open my mouth wide, it might lock. And none of us want that. That would, that would be very, very bad. So I, I, I think I'm a bit mumbly. I do apologise. We can, we can hear you even, even above the rain. Don't worry. Excellent. Okay. Um, so let's have... Look, now you've, you, now you've started a torrent of well wishes, Sal, in the chat box. Um, well, thank you. Yeah. Um, Okay, so I think, I mean, we'd, we've got a couple more questions. So if, if anyone else has got a question, do please get it in because we'll work through these questions and then um, wrap the scene or this, this session up. But we've got a couple to get through first. So um, I'm sorry, I'm just trying to make sense of this one. Whose eyes to sense the scene when multiple characters are present? I'm not quite sure. That's uh, well, it depends. I mean, if if it's third person, so let's break let's break that that question down again. Read it one more time, please. So, whose eyes to sense the scene when multiple characters present? So, I think what is being asked is whose whose point of view? Yeah, is the scene through if multiple characters are present? That can only be judged by by you as your as the author um if if it's third person you you can tell us a lot by whose point of view you give us you know that that in itself is giving giving the the reader a rich source of information because if we suddenly see the main protagonist through the eyes of a of another character through the eyes of a child or through the eyes of the doorman or through the eyes of of um somebody on the periphery of a fight you know we're going to get a completely different look at them so wisdom would would normally say stick with you know it obviously if it's first person you haven't got any choice but if it's third person wisdom would usually say so it's kind of stick with the same point of view or the yeah. same two or three points of view throughout but if you suddenly switch that can be really effective like i said to to, to the the, the only problem with that is we can get back to Chekhov again. A thing called Chekhov's gun, where uh, Chekhov said, "Never, if you put a gun on the on the wall, if you hang a gun on the wall in the first act, it's got to go off by the end of the third, or words to that effect." Uh, because your reader's there, and then they think there's a gun there. Someone's going to get that gun. Someone's going to grab that gun, and someone's going to get shot. And if they don't, you're, you're just constantly waiting for that gun to go off. Now, if you suddenly switch POV to uh, a, a child, for example, the danger is that your reader's going to think that child's going to be important. We just got that child's point of view he, that, you know, he'll be coming back. I've got to remember that child. So if you do it, you've got to give the scene closure. 
you've yeah. got to you've got to somehow tell your reader that that child's not going to come back it was just a moment um and that is it's, that sounds very difficult but actually it's not that difficult but it's, it's pretty easy once you're in the swing of it yeah. um but but yes yeah, suddenly switching prv can be really really effective it's a good question um all Thank good you. questions by the way there they are and we do we do love and i know we don't always get to every single one um and do I know some of them are slightly off topic? I will try and get to those this evening as well. Um, so do include yeah, those. Yeah, we can take now, some off topic ones. That's not a problem. Especially now in these longer, um, sorry, not in these longer sessions, but in these sessions where we've got a bit more time for Q and A. Mm. Okay, and well, in fact, on on that very point, um, I've just had another request. I know it's not the subject at hand, but you've touched on it. Please explain the passive voice. Now, I I think we should probably have a longer session on this rather than do yeah. it and go. Um, um, so if you bear with us, maybe Sally, maybe you and I can talk about how we could bring that into next month. We did do active and passive, didn't we? So I think we can yeah. we can revisit it. It's a long, it's a long thing. And I think especially if, if somebody doesn't understand it, it's very important to deconstruct it and do it properly. It's a, it's a very good question and it's something that that, that bothers people a lot. So um, I would if be you... delighted to address it properly. But I, I think it's, it's a longer run up than we've got tonight, I think. One thing that may help is if you are using Pro Writing Aid and um, it flags a passive voice in your writing, there is a small eye, an icon with an eye in the middle of it um, on the pop up on your page. If you click that, that's our kind of um, integrated learning and it will open a new box and it will. Uh, it has a, a short article about the passive voice and also a video explainer. Um, telling you the difference between the active and the passive voice and a link to a longer blog article. Oh, what we'll a great to, idea. Well, you can just go on the Pro Writing A blog and search passive voice and there's plenty of stuff in there. It, it's, it's something particularly on the business writing side as well. We, we deal with a lot. Um, so there, is, there are lots of resources on the site. Um, okay, back to the questions. Uh, is there a particular difference in show, don't tell, you could identify between adult and children's fiction? Well, I don't do children's fiction, as you know, yes. or maybe obviously you don't know. Um, uh, uh, I imagine the difference is quite significant, actually, when you're writing for children, especially for young children. But I, I can't, I always joke about this, but I, it does sadden me a bit, but I can't, I can't do children's yeah. fiction for some reason. Because you do too many other genres already, Sal, maybe that. Could be that, it, but I just, I'm very bad at judging the children's market. So I, so I, yeah, I've said this before, you know, I, there's a Michael Rosen book, you know, we're going on a bear hunt. Yeah. If I'd been given that, I'd have said, this is rubbish. Children aren't going to like this. What, this is a load of old nonsense. Are you going on the bear hunt or not? <laughs> so, you know, I, I just, I, I'm, I, I'm terrible. So I'm sorry that I can't answer that definitively, but I imagine that it's the significant difference yes yes i think you're right and i should have i should have made that point earlier sal um about not uh you know you're not doing children's fiction and thank you jim by the way in chat for using a great passive voice example um just to demonstrate the point about the passive okay francis um interesting question when writing a police procedural i often have interrogation scenes these turn into long passages of dialogue I try to break them up with emotion and minor action, jotting a note, standing up, tipping a chair. But right, it's difficult, that's really good. But it's difficult to avoid getting tiresome. Any ideas how to improve here? So without seeing, it's difficult. Your instinct is great. What you just said is really good. My question is, are you information dumping in, in these scenes? And are you also using a lot of exposition? Are you using the conversation between the, the policeman the policeman listen to me the, the conversation between the policeman <laughs> between the police person and the the detective and the uh person in custody to tell the audience the reader things that they should know so are you basically having them telling each other things that they already know that's one question if you are cut that back um if you're not doing that <laughs> you've still got to cut it back you've you've got to get to the heart of what you want again 
it's very tempting, I know, to, to chuck everything in. And certainly in the first draft, to chuck it all in. I always say this. But you've got to think of your reader. You've got to think, what, what do I need the reader to know in this scene? Yep. Really, I just need them to know that the glove was found in the flower bed. That's all I really need to know. Now, it's going to be a bit crass if I just have the, <laughs> a very short scene of, of the of the detective saying we found the glove in the flower bed and the the, the perp going oh no that but you know so but but focus on the stuff that you need to be telling us you need to be telling us stuff about what's happened in the plot that's what they're telling us you need to be telling us a bit about the detective if that's the main character or even if it's not you need to be it they are not you need to be telling us a bit about the criminal and so this is i don't know what's happened to my language tonight the criminal but anyway that person so focus on what the reader needs to get from the scene and then focus on the best and most interesting and rich and informative way you can tell them that without information dump without exposition and without um, waffle, without waffling on. And I'm using terms like exposition and so on. I'm sort of guessing that everyone here knows what I'm talking about, but if anyone doesn't, please do just ask and I will explain. Okay, thanks Sal. Um, so one from Razi, how do you show emotions when the character tries to hide them or perhaps this character is strongly self-professed? Strongly self-professed. Um, well, you know what the, the obvious thing is, so I urge you against it, would be a facial tick or something like that. But what you've got to do is think about people. Think about yourself. What do you do if you're, not, if you're trying not to give something away or if you're trying not to show emotion? People's hands go... Oh, oh, oh sorry, self-possessed. Sorry, Sal, Raz has just corrected that. Do you know what? I kind of thought you meant self-possessed. <laughs> I didn't even twig. Yeah. I'm so, so sorry. I was doing I was doing a beautiful mind there about what um what you do if if you're trying not to show emotion. And one thing that people do a lot is they put their hand over their mouth. It's really basic stuff. Um they um they try and um they will try and use their hands to but they will also hold their hands sort of still because they don't want to to give things away with their hands. So have a think, put yourself a very good thing for all any kind of scene is is make yourself act it out this so people are always very taken aback when i say this and i always use this example of of knowing an author who who you know found a victorian keyhole and bent down and looked through the keyhole because they wanted to know what you could see through a victorian keyhole yes this is the kind of stuff you've got to be doing you've got to get out there and do your your footwork people so if you're trying to show emotion without showing emotion put yourself in the scene what do you what would you do how would you act what would you say you're really panicking but you don't want anyone to see that so my yeah. immediate reaction is my hand goes to my neck i don't know why body language a body language expert yeah. would be able to tell you why so just think put yourself in there that's that's the best way but very good very good question you know, these are hard things to do yeah um, okay. and, and of course your housemates will think you're mad <laughs> yes um we need to we need to start wrapping this up there are a couple of others um and so ian ian as mentioned sorry this is not relevant to the topic but you wanted to let some of your writing group know about pro writing aid events and material you'd like a share button i'm going to pass that on to our team ian um i think there is a share um but maybe i'm wrong maybe it's a follow us button actually on the blog but I'm, i'll look into that um and pass it on to that team if it's something we can do um okay we've got a yeah how do i end the story and leave the possibility for a sequel so that's not re related to what we're doing tonight i but, can answer uh, that yeah that would be good one let's go with that um you can't what you have to remember is if you're if you're doing i mean i've talked about this before if you're doing a, a trilogy say 
so your trilogy's got to have its overriding arc, right? That's got to have its its it's like Freitag's pyramid. It's got to have its beginning, its climax, and its falling action and its end. But each so you've got your overriding arc of the trilogy, but each book in the trilogy has to have its own arc. So you can't leave any of the books. You can't leave the first book open. You have to close your first book. You have to finish it. You have to give the reader a sense of closure. If you want to lead us into the next book, it's better not to just introduce something on the last page. It's better to seed it from at least the middle of the book, gently, you know, subtly, um, and then give us a sort of bit of a, a, a heftier clue towards the end of the book, uh, not necessarily on the last page. Because what you don't want is somebody to finish a book and think, oh, this doesn't feel finished. What did that mean? So it's, 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 it's quite a, it's a delicate um, tightrope walk. Yeah. But if you, if you see something throughout, again, if you think of everyone's got their own fav favorite trilogy or, 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 or book that, you know, that has a sequel. If you, if you think about how it's done um, there, it's, it's often um, just a whisper. It's often just a whisper. On the other hand, sometimes it's a huge brass band with, you know, 76 trombones. It's just, it's just the way you want to do it. But the main point is make sure that your book has proper closure. It's yeah. got to have its own story up. So don't leave a sort of ending open. I mean, wide open, doors open, horse gone. Don't, don't do that. Yeah. So we're going to end with this question. Uh, and it comes from Sandra. And she's asked about internal thoughts of the main character. So the internal thoughts of the main character. Are these good for show, not tell? Or is that still too close to telling? No, um, internal thoughts are great. Put them in italics, yeah. ideally. So it's very clear that that's what they are. Okay, um, so she, she's used the example, an example sentence, he looked at the wall and wondered how this cold, smooth surface could be all that oh, I see. of the city. No, that's, that's great. That's really, that's really good. That's not, I thought you meant literal internal thoughts, like, um, yeah. Uh, no. what am I doing in this dump? But, you know, but I don't know why I was put on this awful accent when I did that. Um, but either one, either one, yes, definitely. Very good. Very good, subtle way of doing it, actually. So, yes, hurrah. Great. Um, and with that, I think we're going to bring the, see the today's session. I must stop saying this evening. I know it's not this evening for many of you. We're going to bring today's session to an end. So, um, as ever, a huge thank you for joining us and putting up with us for another hour, giving us an hour of your precious time. Um, we do hope you found it useful. Uh, we're sorry we don't get to all questions. I'm sorry we ramble on a bit sometimes, me especially, but it's great to have you with us uh, and we look forward to seeing you in a month's time. Right, Sal? Absolutely. And I have to say, I think we're great. Um, <laughs> uh, nothing wrong with a bit of rambling. Um, <laughs> Absolutely. And what I always say is just thank you all so much. We could, you know, we quite literally could not do this without you. It's so appreciated that you turn up here every month, yeah. contribute, make it what it is, ask such great questions. And uh, thank you all so much for, for joining us. Yeah. Yeah. We'll see absolutely. you. Uh, what are we doing next month, Tom? Oh, there's a question. Um, what are we doing next month? We are doing unless someone else jumps in there before me oh, i should know this i'm so sorry i didn't mean to put you on this no 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 i have got it i have got it in front of me it is oh we were talking yeah we we're talking about research yeah we're doing research book excellent. research excellent yeah. well actually i'm going to be all about little... peering through victorian keyholes right Some, something like that i'm going to give you a little a little taste of research which is something that came up uh, in between the last session and this one, you, I'm always talking about one of my favourite authors to use as an example is Elizabeth George, as you may well all know, who writes mysteries, cr uh, sort of crime thrillers. Uh, I, I think she's a master of her art. And interestingly, I have been trying to get my sister to read Elizabeth George for years. 
And she told me recently that she'd read a couple and she said, I'm not reading anymore. <laughs> and I was shocked. I was shocked to my core. Why not? And she reminded me of something because Elizabeth George writes, has been writing the same series for, I think, about 20 years now. I'd forgotten how I felt reading the first two or three books. And interestingly, what happens, and I really, I hope, I, I don't feel Elizabeth George is going to be watching this, but if she is, I love your books. But the, she's an American writer and the stories are set in England. And what she did with the first three, I think she came to England, she did a ton of research. And I can tell you that she did because some of the books were were set in places that I lived and I could see she'd literally walked around the streets and made notes of stuff and she'd really absorbed English culture but she had not developed her ear well enough so uh, this won't really mean anything to, to American or maybe it will to American readers but I remember one book first of all she had everyone in England talking about the royal family and quoting Shakespeare which we honestly don't all the time because she's an Anglophile and, and, and you know, enjoyed that aspect of, of our culture. But the other thing was the small details of, um, she had somebody eating a packet of vinegar crisps. We don't have vinegar crisps, we have salt and vinegar crisps. It sounds like a very small thing, but it's actually a huge thing. It's, it's the, it then makes the needle screech off the record. So even somebody as fantastic as Elizabeth, Elizabeth George, you see, that was my Elizabeth <laughs> George, um, even when she's done a ton of research, it's, it's important. My point that I'm getting to is to get a good editor. And I think she had an American editor and after the first two or three books, she got somebody with an English eye to look over this, the, the, the books. And I've, or either she'd spent more time in England, but these problems disappeared. So, you know, it, it's easy to go wrong, even when you try really, really hard. Um, but do try really, really hard because you'll get it right in the end. Is kind of where I'm going with this. I think I've lost. I think I've lost the battle with my sister, but I'll keep trying. <laughs> you told me that before, so it's a great, a great example. But so yes, we'll go into that in more detail um, in November. Um, so in a month's time, November. and we'll be back to Tuesday. So the second Tuesday of the month. So slightly different. This was just a one month only um, because of Romance Week. So thank you once again. For joining us we look forward to seeing you in uh i guess just over three weeks time um and uh bring your questions we look forward to answering them all then have a safe rest of your day uh, and we'll see you all soon goodbye Bye, everyone